By the way, I think it's, I don't know that it's expensive. I think uh, the fix for what you want to do mm -hmm. with acrylic is really a simple fix. You know, if you, if you break down what it is you like about something, mm -hmm. and then you think about what it is that you want from something, it becomes much easier. If you hang on to the wood filler, instead of thinking what is about the tactility, because that's really what I think you like about it. Very much. With the tactility. Um, and how to get that tactility in, a, in, in an acrylic media, it's really, it's not that hard. They can put a filler into um, lightweight molding paste. It'll take them 10 minutes and you will have something. It's really, it's, there are a variety of fillers, but the more you can think about the language of it, what your goal is, um, the more readily available they'll understand what it is they might want to put into it okay. that is inert. The problems with the wood filler is that it is not completely inert. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very... And the dye that they're using, which not pigment, over time will influence the color of your paintings. I that's think, I what... I haven't seen it yet. It has you, been over it's, 10 years. It's, that's a short period of time. You want your paintings to stand the test of time. You want your paintings, to, you know, you love Bryce Marden, you love Marioni, you want those pictures to stand 50 years, 100 years. Mm -hmm. You want to know how they stand up against Rembrandt mm -hmm. or any of the other old guys that you might like. You know, right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying Rembrandt, you might be, you, you know, he may not be your God, personal godhead. He's not my personal godhead. I, I, of course, he's great, but... What I'm suggesting is the time frame that you're talking about is very small. The conditions that your art has been placed in are very limited. The minute that you start having art move about the world, things happen to it. It gets cold, it gets hot, it gets wet, it gets dry, it's in this humidity. It's in the, it's, it becomes part of the life of the work. And then things start to happen. You know, it's like, it's, you know, it's like the great, uh, the flood that happened in uh, the 70s in Texas and uh, all these, all this art had been covered with poly and on the poly. Mind if recording this? Yeah, it's okay. And the poly had um, magic marker across it. Mm. And even the pictures that didn't get wet it, it, you could speak to an artist and say, oh, well, you know, Susan, I've been, you know, I've wrapped my paintings for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Nothing's ever happened. You know, the magic marker is fine. And I would say it's not stable. So as soon as it hit high uh, humidity and flood conditions in Texas, all of a sudden you had paintings with everything that was on the poly on the front of the picture. It speeded up the process and there it was. So when your work is out and about, good things and bad things happen to it. It faces conditions that you don't always think about in the studio. But it will face those conditions eventually. And depending on you, your attitude as an artist depends on how you feel about it. Um, I come from a tradition of, you know, Bauhaus and truth to the materials and I'm proud of being a craftsman. You know, I don't, you know, I don't have any illusions about profession. I'm okay with getting my hands dirty. Um, all of the stuff that comes with being an artist in that regard is f perfectly wonderful to me. And in knowing that, I care about those things. I want to be able to say to somebody who shells out real dollars that helps me keep on the mission that I'm on, 
I want to be able to say, to the best of my ability, this will stand the test of time. The artists that I admire most, these are the things they cared about. You know, uh, these are the things that mattered. It doesn't matter to all artists. I understand that. And I'm not making a value judgment on whether that's good or bad for somebody else. But they are decisions. And if you, you can make them or not, if you don't make the decision, the decision is made for you anyway in time. You know, time is a great equalizer. And doing nothing um, is also doing something over time. So these are the th these are the things I think about, as opposed to uh, pictorial space and you know the you know the other stuff of it. Mm -hmm. I don't. Th those are the, those are the things I don't. I, I'm about as abstract a painter as you could possibly imagine. If you cut me in half, I'm still abstract all the way through. You know um, how I think, how I talk. I mean, you called it poetic. I'm flattered, but I, I'm abstract right to my core. And when I do think, these are the things I think about. You know, uh, I see things that I love, and I wonder how I can do that because the core of my aesthetic is um, while one of the places it's best stated is James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man. He states that the job of an artist is the same, comma, anew. So when I look to be inspired by great uh, scholar stones, I come up with a new material at Golden's. Okay. I have um, one, one other insight into the, the history of my work, as it is, um, that a lot of people don't know, is um, granted none of the stuff that you've seen, but uh, a lot of my older work from, say, uh, 2005 and back was, uh, was all sitting in a shed outside of my dad's house that didn't really, that wasn't completely sealed up for probably, you know, six to eight years. And, you know, that, and, you know you're talking about mm -hmm. the differences uh -huh. in humidity and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it went through everything that there possibly could be, except, you know, uh, <laughs> my dad would park the, the lawnmower in there. And after he'd get done mowing the lawn, there'd still be little mo lawn clippings you know, and that would end up sometimes getting blown onto the paints. <laughs> so when I finally moved everything out, I had to clean. I had to clean the surfaces of mm -hmm. like almost all my paintings because they all had like kind of like a lawn lawn stuff, lawn clippings and whatever on them. And uh, all those years of of you know the heat, the cold, the humidity, and uh, I didn't see anything that looked like it had any kind of problems with you it. You will. We'll see. If you live long enough, you will. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of things. Mm -hmm. um, no different than Hurricane Sandy. Yeah. You can predict and predict. Nobody believes the prediction. And then there's the perfect storm. And that's, it's, it, 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 it's, you can be lucky for so long and then, and then something, something right happens in the mix. And, um, and even, you know, you, you know, you can't protect against all things, but you can be knowledgeable. You can be knowledgeable. And then you can have, then you make choices. You know, then you make choices. Um, you know, there's things that I'd like to do with the steel that are just outrageously unaffordable. But if I started 
if I had a market for them and I started to make some money, I would put it back in and try some of these things that, you know, are just out of the ballpark expensive. You know, uh, what, are, what are some of those things? Oh, I'd cold okay. dip them. And, oh, you know, okay. I do a lot. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of different things that are just, you know, fabulously expensive. Mm -hmm. But you have to charge a lot of money for the art in order to do some of those things. Yeah. And I am not in that bracket. Um, you know, Frank Stella gets to play with some pretty far out shit. But he sells for enough money that he can play in big leagues. Mm -hmm. Material-wise, I'm not talking yeah. about quality or goodness or that. I'm, but, you know, you, if you can afford titanium, yeah, you know, I mean... But that's not an excuse not to make great art, because you can make it out of anything. You can make great art out of anything.